Hello everybody, and welcome to, I guess I'll call it a webcast for lack of anything better to call it. Uh, so, here's the background. Uh, last year you will have noticed, uh, most of you, that I went up to the Flying Heritage Collection and did a talk on myths of American armor. And uh, this actually seemed to go around rather well, uh, to the extent that I was asked to go back up again and give another talk this year, which I duly did. Uh, the difference was that we didn't have a spare cameraman around to record it. So we decided, well, why not see if we can do this by, uh, by sort of a webcast. And there are some positives and negatives. I mean, uh, one of the positives is that because I have a little bit more time to think, uh, I'm going to make fewer verbal errors. And uh, it's one of the things I hate doing is I hate reading from prepared notes, you know, verbatim, because they're boring as all heck. And similarly, I don't like reading what's on the screen on the PowerPoint, because, well, frankly, most of you can read English, and there's no point in my reading it for you. Um, but this does mean that on occasion I get something slightly wrong. So, for example, in the talk I said, uh, for re with regards to the honey name for the Stuart, that even if the British used it, they got it from the Yanks. And well, that was a slip of the tongue un under the, under the moment. I mean, I don't doubt, I don't deny that the British use the term, uh, but they did get it from the Yanks. Even Robert Crisp's book, and uh, you, if you haven't seen it since, I've actually put up a couple of notations, annotations onto the video, uh, stated, "Yeah, my driver got it because he was hanging around with a uh, with a Texan, uh, one of the advisors that came with the came with the Stuart." And of course, I get it right in the text uh, and the written article, but uh, not in a moment. So it's less likely of uh, that sort of thing going wrong here. The downside is that this isn't going to flow quite as well. I actually kind of enjoy talking to people. Uh, but anyway, the bottom line. Uh, this is an attempt at uh, redoing this talk that I gave up at FHC in uh, 2016. Uh, because, hey, I put effort into it. Why not, why not get a slightly bigger audience than the 100-odd people that sat down in front of me? So, uh, that's uh, pretty much the background to it. Uh, so, on with uh, the slideshow, such as it is. And, as you can imagine, it's on tank destroyers. What was your first clue? And the reason I picked it was because I happened to have the documentation on the drive, and, you know, I've about finished my two-volume two tome on tank destroyer development. Uh, still looking for an editor and publisher, if anybody's interested. Um, so I, I had it ready, so you know, why, why not dive into it? It's a subject I know a bit about. It's not as fascinating as Myths of Armor. Was, uh, having a chat with Dan Snow, he's there saying, oh, yeah, anything with myths or top ten in it is going to be, it's going to spread like wildfire. This is going to be a little bit more esoteric, uh, probably less popular demand, but uh, what the hey, the information's good, and I'm sure some of it at least will come as news to you. Uh, so I might as well start off with the first slide. Um, the successful failure, why do I call it that? Well, I mean, there's not really any denying that the tank destroyers were a bit of a waste. Uh, as evidenced by, in short order, after the war, they got rid of them. Uh, they were abolished as a branch. Uh, on the other hand, there's also no denying that they, they did their job. Uh, they worked. They killed things in much better ratios than they lost. Uh, so to that extent, they were also a success. Uh, as for the logo, I hear a lot of people saying uh, it's a Hellcat or a Panther. It's not. It's a Cougar. How do you know that, uh, you may ask? And the answer is, we got the documentation. And uh, if I just bring it up on my other screen here, uh, I'm sort of doing a split screen so I can read the notes. Uh, September 28th, 1942, uh, following shoulder sleeve has been approved, yada yada. Uh, a cougar's face in black with markings in red, eyes, whiskers, and teeth in white, crunching a blank, a black tank. Crunching is a doctrinal term, apparently. Uh, and it is non-specific as to the type of tank. Uh, but there you go, anyway, it's a cougar. So, uh, that sets that one to rest. Okay, so this slide you will have seen before if you saw my um, my previous uh, slideshow, and it, the answers are exactly the same. If you are one of the few people watching this who has not seen the Mits of Armor, 
I am a tanker by trade, I uh, hold the rank of major right now in the National Guard. Uh, and as I said last time, this means nothing. Uh, whether or not I know how to operate Bradleys and Abrams on the modern battlefield is of limited relevance uh, when it comes to doing research on World War II tank destroyer development. Um, and the plus side for, for me though is that my civilian job is that I work as effectively a researcher, historian for a computer game company. And although you probably should not learn your tank history from the computer game, you may as well learn it from Hollywood or Wikipedia, Anyway, um, I do do a lot of digging in archives and uh, anywhere else I can, so that's who I am. So, on with the show. And this slide and the next one, its purpose is to make you think about the difference between TDs as they actually were, and TDs as a lot of people think of them. So what we have here are four vehicles, uh, four pieces of equipment. Uh, they all saw combat duty in World War II with the U.S. military. Three of them are tank destroyers. One of them is not. Which one? You see, if this was a live show, I'd be asking people, and they'd be giving their guesses. So I'm afraid I, all I can do is give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Okay, so here's your answer. Top right corner. The four pieces of equipment are the 37mm gun motor carriage M6, the 57mm gun M1, the 3 inch gun M5 and the 75 millimeter gun motor carriage M3. Of those, the top right corner, the 57, was not a tank destroyer, it was an anti tank gun. And you may think, well, what's the difference between an anti tank gun that's 57 millimeters and an anti tank gun that is 3 inches? Well, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, so, you go on to the next slide, and this kind of reinforces the point. Now this is the reverse. Of the four vehicles posted here, one of them is a tank destroyer. Which is the tank destroyer? How to think about it? You're probably particularly confused by the two at the bottom that look very, very similar to each other. How can one ergo, but we know that one's a tank destroyer, right? It's the M10. Well, the answer is that the one tank destroyer out of those four is the one on the bottom right. Top left, if you're curious, is a Deacon. It's a 57mm, or correction, a 6-pounder on a truck chassis, effectively. The 2-pounder Porte is up at the top right corner, or Porte, some people will call it. Uh, bottom left is a uh, gun anti-tank quick firing 3 inch on self propelled mount M10. That's what the British call it. And on the bottom right corner, 3 inch gun motor carriage M10. Yes, they are both M10s, but why is one a tank destroyer and one is not? Well, the one on the bottom left is a self propelled anti-tank gun. It is physically exactly the same piece of hardware. The difference is that it is crewed by Royal Artillery and categorized as an anti-tank gun, used as an anti-tank gun in anti-tank regiments, uh, complete with also towed 6-pounder uh, and 17-pounder guns. Whereas the American M10 is a tank destroyer used in tank destroyer units. So what I'm getting at between these two slides is a tank destroyer is not a piece of hardware per se. It is a mode of use. And that, that, that's, I think, one of the first things people have got to get their, their mind around. Uh, a lot of people will get wrong. They'll, they'll think of a tank destroyer as a piece of equipment. So how do they come about? Uh, so here is the military problem-solving model. It is no longer apparently in the manual, at least I couldn't find it. Uh, but it's a logical sequence of events that militaries have used, at least the American military, to come up with a solution to a problem. And there are seven steps. You can see them there. So step one is to define the problem. And the problem as demonstrated uh, is illustrated by this photo. Um, the photo I think was taken near Sedan uh, in 
during the German invasion of the French and Low Countries. And as you can see, you got th a whole bunch of armor, 38Ts, Mark II, Mark IV, I think that is there. Uh, and it's supporting assets, logistics, infantry, and so on and so forth. And what was obviously happening was these things were making merry, running right around the French and the British. And uh, they're all generally making a mockery of their defense plans. This concerned the Americans somewhat, uh, because the French and the British were considered to be quite competent organizations, uh, those militaries. So, hmm, okay, obviously this is the problem, is that they are charging through. And this was how they, they generally defended at the time. You had a... Uh, you had your defensive line of infantry and maybe fortifications interspersed with anti-tank guns. Uh, and the enemy would attack, probably with infantry in there as well, uh, into this line of anti-tank guns. Uh, by way of uh, reference, the French uh, had an issuance of anti-tank guns. Uh, again, they, these aren't big, they're like 25mm, 47mm. Uh, about one gun every 100 meters uh, was their typical average basis of issue. And well, that was considered to be enough to stop uh, the average attacking force. Well, here's the problem. That was the ideal. In actuality, this happened. And uh, they simply isolated, or made redundant, a number of the anti-tank weapons and defenses by use of a barrier, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah. The bottom line is they focused their firepower in one small, poor, unfortunate area. And the anti-tank defenses there simply were going to get overwhelmed. I mean, okay, they might knock out one or two, but you, know, you, you ain't going to win. So that was the uh, standard method of anti-tank defense, and it was proven to be un, uh, unsatisfactory. And what's worse is this was the standard of anti-tank thought of the U.S. military at the time. Um, I wrote this one up, it's, uh, if you google the Chieftain's Hatch, Rifles versus Tanks. The US military was so uh, devoid of good anti-tank weapon systems that they were literally were trying to think of anything they could do to stop enemy tanks. To include the concept of throwing things uh, in the tracks. And as you can see, they sacrificed a number of small arms and machine guns did not work very well. Uh, on the right hand side you have a declassified photograph of an anti-tank rock. And uh, the rock lost, it got chopped up uh, into two pieces, so what you see there is the uh, remains of the rock after that half of it was crushed off. Uh, okay, yeah, they also had Molotov cocktails, they had caliber 50 machine guns, which in fairness was a pretty good weapon against most armor, but not a proper tank. Uh, eventually they decided that, okay, we need a proper gun, they selected the 37mm, they basically copied the thing off the Germans, and put it into construction in 1939. Uh, that's not a great start point for your anti-tank defense. On the plus side, at least they get to start from scratch, you don't have very much invested into already extant solutions. So, here's the problem statement as I would have viewed it. And um, I, again, I, sh I should be clear, this is an, a, a sample analysis of how you get to the end result of the tank destroyers. This is not the thought process verbatim of what was going on. Um, I haven't actually seen the original text on it, but you, you just bear with me. Uh, the bottom line though is, you know, whatever the actual verbiage being used by McNair and anybody else, this is your problem. How does the U.S. Army, with the resources it has, stop these German assaults when your standard reputable forces of uh, France and the U.K. have failed? Uh, and there was an additional problem. The U.S. Army was not really very clued in about tanks to begin with, because they didn't have very, modern, uh, very many modern ones to play with, uh, and not very many officers knew very much about modern tanking. Uh, now, that said, they were very willing to try things out, hence he had the Louisiana and Carolina maneuvers. Alright, so, step two through our process. Gather facts and make assumptions. So, 
your first assumption is that you're not going to be distributing armor anymore. You're not going to have penny kit packets. You're going to concentrate all your armor in one location for that hard punch as opposed to the spread fist, as they put it. And the second assumption is that you can't build enough anti-tank guns to s distribute everywhere to prepare for the German attack or you know, the enemy attack wherever it happens to come. You, there's just not the resources to do it. Therefore, the conclusion would be that any German attack will beat you lines. Uh, you will not, unless you're really damn lucky, you're really, really good, uh, you're not going to stop them. Uh, they will attack in a place of their choosing, they will overwhelm you, and they will break through. You can argue if that is a good assumption, or a worst case assumption, but given what happened to the French and the, Dur and the Bil uh, British, it's not a bad place to start. So, step three, define your end state and establish criteria. So the end state, as I would see it, uh, German attacks defeated, US forces prepared for follow-on operations, which is standard army blather, uh, modern army blather, but uh, this generally gets the point across. And your criteria, well, it must be an efficient use of resources ahead of time. And what I mean by ahead of time is that whatever you are bringing to the fight, you have already built and trained and deployed all this stuff. And you also can't, you know, you don't want it to be too expensive in terms of manpower and materiel once it's done. So, develop possible solutions. So what I did at this point in the in presentation, I just went around the audience and said, well, throw me some ideas. How would you actually deal with this problem? And, uh, you know what, they came up with a few answers. Some were sensible enough, some were brand new ideas, but okay. So, for the sake of the exercise, uh, I came up with a couple. So, option one, meet enemy tanks with your own tanks. Meet enemy tanks with mass anti-tank weapons. You can read these. There's various different options. You know, they get the job done. Alright, so, step five. You analyze and compare them. Well, where's your analysis? Uh, if you choose option one, meet the enemy tanks with your own tanks. Well, here's the positives. We already have tanks. Okay, maybe not great ones, but we're making more. And uh, we're also making ones with anti-tank weapon systems, the M3 medium with the 75. Uh, the, you know, the 37 just wasn't cutting it anymore, but we got new tanks coming. And this also means that it simplifies your training and equipment, because everybody's going around with tanks. Now, here's a sort of a neutral. Your tanks are equal. Your tanks are probably about the same level as the enemy tanks, so you just kind of button heads, and where's your relative advantage that you're pushing? And they're reasonably mobile, they'll, they'll get there eventually. Uh, and the downside, tanks are not attacking if you're doing this. And they will not be available for the attack until they've recovered, they've repaired their damage, they've restowed, they've rested, they've, they've done their maintenance. And uh, if you believe that the purpose of the tank is to attack, this ain't so great. So let's try the next one meet the enemy tank with mass anti-tank weapons. Well, here's a couple of positives. Firstly, it's cheaper than a tank because a towed gun is much, much cheaper than a than a tank is. And towed guns are very good at killing tanks. Uh, they can also be the fastest to react uh, because they are light, they are mobile, and you tow them behind a jeep at 40 miles an hour. Downside, this takes additional manpower and additional equipment. So all these guys that you have manning these anti-tank weapons are not doing anything else. Isolate them? Okay, well here's a positive, you're not trying to kill tanks, you're avoiding direct contact. Well the problem though is that you need to have the space to let the pocket form that you can then get behind. Uh, or you... Uh, the other problem is really that you have to attack somewhere in order to isolate them, and if they've done their due diligence and they've got good flank guards and so on, it actually may not work. Other options. Destroy the sporting assets. Yeah, you can, you can get the general idea here. So, uh, there's always a positive and a negative, or at least almost always a positive and negative, with any course of action you choose to deal with the problem. Um, another negative, actually, with obstacles is that uh, you got to watch them. You can't just place an obstacle. Uh, they take a very long time to build. Right? Anyway, I, I digress. Uh, these were the sorts of thinkings that you can imagine that the guys in 1940 were doing. 
So, on that basis, they decided to go with option 2, meet the opposition with massed anti-tank weapons. So, the enemy would charge through, they'd burst through the poor unfortunate sods over here, and the remainders will keep going, at which point massed anti-tank weapons would go to meet them. I mean, you know, you've written off these guys, but there wasn't anything you can do about it anyway. What you can do, though, is you have your massed firepower just ready to concentrate and deal with the enemy attack that way. And that is the j that's the basic of the tank destroyer doctrine, in a nutshell. And that's what they did. They uh, had to select uh, and distribute and equip tank destroyer units. Now they wanted to... they firstly had to make an independent arm out of it. Both the infantry and the artillery were fighting over who gets to control this asset. Uh, armored Force, curiously, didn't want to have anything to do with it, because Armored Force are very offensively minded. Their job is to exploit the breakthroughs, run run riot around the enemy's rear areas, catch them off guard, flank attacks, to work. Anti-tank defense was defensive and not in their mindset at all. So, just the two the two sides were arguing, the infantry and the artillery, and the end result was, saw this, we're not going to give it to either of you, we're going to make an independent arm, we'll call it the Tank Destroyer Branch. And thus it was. So in charge was a guy by the name of Andrew Bruce, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. But by, by the end of the war, obviously he was uh, general, uh, major general. Uh, his background: he graduated Texas A&M in 1916 and shipped overseas to France as a provisional lieutenant. I'm not entirely sure what a provisional lieutenant is, but that's what he was. Commanded a machine gun battalion in 2nd ID and fought in every one of its major engagements. Uh, he came back with a Distinguished Service Cross, Legion of Honor, Crodiger with two palms and a star, a couple of other decorations, minor things. Uh, basically, the man was a fighter, uh, quite aggressive. Uh, so they gave him this reactionary force to play with. Uh, Tank Destroyer Command was activated in November of 41. So, where to start? What did he want? This is the sort of thing that Bruce wanted. Really fa- oh, there we go. Rocket-powered tanks. Really fast things that would get to the point of penetration very quickly with a gun. And, and Bruce was kind of laser focused on this concept. And there was really only one vehicle that he absolutely wanted. Uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. On the other hand, this is what McNair wanted. Uh, McNair, of course, the head of Army Grand Forces. Uh, not at the time AGF hadn't been created, but you know, he's up there in the, in the chain. And uh, what we have here is a anti-tank gun. Uh, it's, uh, I believe it's a Pac-40, German anti-tank gun, in an open field. Now, uh, I'm, I went over McNair a little bit in the previous talk, and uh, he was a man of influence and he was a man of strong opinions. He was not the ultimate decision maker. That's an important thing to note. Now, however, since we're talking about it, let me read a couple of his quotes. Um, when the armored vehicle faces the anti-tank gun, the combat is essentially a fire action between a moving gun platform in plain view and a small, carefully concealed stationary gun platform. Now, we say small because back in 1940 they were small. I mean, the, the huge anti-tank guns like the 17 pounder and the 88, you know, they, they weren't really contemplated at the point. The struggle is analogous to that between ships and shore guns, and there is no question that shore guns are superior so much that the ship does not accept such a contest. Again, it would appear he was not talking to the US Navy very much, because that's exactly what the US Navy did a couple of times during the war. If the gun outmatches the tank, then not only is the gun superior to the tank in the anti-tank defense, but employing armored units against other armored units positively should be avoided whenever possible. The gun, supported properly by foot troops, should defeat hostile armored units by fire and free the friendly armored units for actions against objectives which are vulnerable to them. So again, he's looking at the economy, save the tanks for the offense. Or another quote of his. Certainly it is a poor economy to use a $35,000 medium tank to destroy another tank 
when the job can be done by a gun costing a fraction as much. The friendly armoured force is free to attack a more proper target, the enemy force as a whole. So again, this is McNair putting his two cents in. Now, bear in mind this was completely not what Bruce wanted. Bruce wanted vehicles. And so Bruce effectively went to General Marshall, and got Marshall's support, and won. Tank Destroyer Branch would be vehicle mounted. So, the overall organization of a Tank Destroyer Battalion, and this particular organization lasted until 43, uh, at which point they realized it was completely overmanned, uh, we needed the manpower somewhere else, and they reduced it by about 25%, mainly by removing security forces and anti-aircraft cannons. And uh, the gist of it is that, whoops, excuse me, you start off with your HQ company with its signals, maintenance, and uh, transportation sections, uh, platoons. There are three anti-tank companies, or tank destroyer companies. One platoon was light, and that had two sections of two guns each, a uh, anti-aircraft section and a security infantry section. The other two platoons in the company were heavy gun platoons, again two sections of two, with anti-aircraft and infantry. So these are very robust little organizations. Uh, although, uh, for basis of comparison, um, an infantry battalion was 916 personnel. The numbers, the 600 series tank destroyer battalions were going to be associated with infantry uh, units and the 700s were going to be associated with armored units. Didn't end up being that way, but that was the thinking initially. So what do you equip them with? And this is where we start looking at the large amount of vehicles that Tank Destroyer Branch tried uh, out in their search for a vehicle. Uh, I seem to recall, if I did a hey count right, there was over 35 types of Tank Destroyer trialed. So you start off in May of 41, and a stripped down uh, vehicle, Jeep uh, Bantam I guess, was uh, being tested for Bliss by 1st Cavalry Division, uh, Colonel B.Q. Jones. And he designed a pedestal mount for the 37mm gun, known as a Jones mount. That's it on the bottom right corner there, on the T2E1. Uh, the T2 was Aberdeen's version of the same thing, but the 37mm on the Bantam Jeep, and it's up at the top left corner. Now, the, both failed, because uh, by the time you add the crew and the ammunition and gun and so on, you're a half a ton over the cargo capacity of the, of the uh, truck. You know, quarter ton truck, and you're putting a three quarters of a ton on it. And it was a little bit too unstable to, to be used as a platform anyway. So, another try was the Swamp Buggy, that's the one at the bottom left, it's the T8. Uh, it's a Ford one and a half ton truck, and it worked out reasonably well, once the bugs, such as the cooling, were worked out. Uh, but, the T21 was accepted into service, the 37mm gun motor carriage, and that made the Swamp Buggy irrelevant. Uh, similarly, top right corner, you have the T-14. Uh, it's going to be the T-13 as well, which was a forward-facing variant. Uh, that one uh, never got built, only the T-14, and it's based on the three-quarter ton Willis 6x6, six six, of which, if I recall, they built about 13 in the end. Um, it actually worked quite well, uh, and arguably was even better than the M6, which was eventually adopted. Uh, but, uh, by the time this was done, in mid-42, it was deemed ill-advised to continue with a 37mm uh, gun program. It was, we already had 37mm tank destroyers, why do we need another one? That wasn't the end of it, though. Other 37mm GMCs, uh, the T-33, top left, uh, that was based on the Ford 3 quarter ton, and was acceptable for use, but again, you have the M6 already in service, it got there first, so why bother? Uh, then there was a, a series of armored cars, or at least five entries. Uh, the two I've shown here are the T22 up at the top right, and the T43 down at the bottom left. It says armored car T21. It was, it was after it was abandoned by Tank Destroyer Branch, they, uh, they gave it over to see if it could be an armored car. And uh, so these were the attempts at an armored mobile tank destroyer with the 37. Now the problem was, is again, 37, and this gun is starting to fall out of favor. Can you mount a 57? Came to question, and the answer was no. Uh, as an aside, the T-22 top right went 
around to the other agencies. This was pretty common. A, a vehicle produced, say, by armored force or by artillery branch would be sent around to the other agencies just to see if they wanted it. And the T-22 got, found its way to armored force. They insisted on a couple of modifications. They turned it into the T-22E1. They liked it, and they accepted it for service as the M8 armored car, a.k.a. the Greyhound. Uh, the 37 on the bottom right, on the white scout car, that was an attempt by the Cavalry Corps. Uh, the vehicle was large, ungainly, less mobile than the T-21. It was armored, which was about the only positive to it, really. And your final winner, the M6. Uh, it was actually the T-21 gun motor carriage was the uh, trial designation. It's the Fargo, three-quarter ton. 37 on the back. And it was selected mainly because it was the first one to meet all the requirements. And remember, Tank Destroyer Branch were in a hurry. They had just been created. The war was now pretty much going to happen. And uh, they needed something now. And so the first guy that met the, all the checkboxes, that's the winner. So there were some issues with cooling, but there was also a parts commonality with the Quartermaster Corps vehicles. Uh, so, hey, we'll take it. The 37 was fully manual. Uh, so you had to open the breech block after firing. And it entered production in early 42 as the 37mm uh, gun motor carriage M4. Uh, then somebody in the US Army figured out that calling everything by the same M series designation was getting a bit confusing. So the M4 got turned into the M6. Uh, so it's not to confuse it with the M4 medium. And that's why the M5 light came after the M3 light. They were sent to Africa and they were found to be singularly useless. That was the end of the light platoon. Now, the heavy platoon, that was a slightly easier problem to solve. Uh, the half-track was already accepted, it was apparently a pretty good vehicle, and it was capable of carrying a 75mm gun, uh, in this case the M1897A4. Uh, first started in July of 1941, the program was standardized by November of 41. Uh, this is one of the early gun shield designs. Uh, Suffice to say, it didn't pass muster. And eventually you end up with the M3 gun motor carriage. And uh, this basically was to hold the fort until the next generation of tank destroyers could come along. Uh, slightly less stopgap. Uh, it was still considered frontline equipment until March of 44, when finally the M18 was adopted, and that was the impetus to get rid of the M3 as soon as they could. Uh, by early 43 also, they started to run out of M1897s, and uh, they developed a new tank destroyer program called the T-73, which was basically the same thing with the Sherman's more modern gun. Uh, but by then, better vehicles were becoming available. Now, it's worth noting that the tank destroyer had the same gun as the tank, and uh, this goes back again to the whole tanks are not designed to fight tanks rubbish. Uh, the if that was the case, why would they give the tank as good a gun as a tank destroyer? And this basically was the pattern to follow for the for the whole of the war. The the tank was always they were always trying to get the same tank destroyer gun into the tank. And indeed that's part of the reason why the tank destroyer fell out of favor by the end of the war anyway. So what's the point? Um anyway. Uh, the armored force tried out the M threes. They they liked them uh in the artillery. Uh, as self-propelled artillery. Uh, it wasn't why they were originally sent over there, but that's what they used them as. And they, they really liked the idea of the self-propelled guns, uh, thought maybe they could use them as assault guns, uh, but had no use for them in the anti-tank role. You know, hey, why? You've already got a tank which is good enough. Uh, but because they liked the self-propelled artillery concept, that kind of gave the impetus to the M7 Howard's motor carriage, the Priest, and all the other self-propelled guns that followed. So there you go, you're one of the progenitors of the lot. So now they have something in service. Great. They're out the door, they're in production. Let's see, can we get something a little bit better? And the 57 was brought to their attention, the British Six Pounder. And this seemed to be the perfect replacement for both the 75 and the uh, 37. It, it had a number of various advantages. Now, one was its relatively lightweight, especially compared to the 75. The rate of fire was definitely higher than the 75. Yeah, and you also, by the way, carried a lot more ammunition. 
and uh, ammunition capacity was a very important thing for the U.S. military at the time, and sort of as a requirement, it's not n thought about very much, but it really was, you, you see in the archives a lot of discussion, can we afford to do this bigger gun at the risk of having smaller ammunition? The uh, muzzle velocity was much higher. Uh, this allowed for a, uh, well, a flatter trajectory, more chance of a hit, uh, and it also had greater penetration than the 75. And lastly, it had a smaller signature. The blast from the muzzle wasn't as big. Fantastic! This is great! So they started the 57mm projects. Working our way around. Top left, T-44. This is the T-33 chassis. They took the 37 off and added the 57. Uh, in, in a nutshell, it was too much gun for the chassis and they had no room for the ammo and crew anyway, so uh, that died by April of 42. Buick were given the task of coming up with a tracked gun motor carriage. Uh, initially it was going to be the T-42 37mm, but that was nixed before it even began because it was a 37. The T-49 though started showing a bit of promise, and it basically used the same turret as the M7 light tank. And uh, you, you look at it and in in your initial reaction is no, but you realize it is the same design, just welded and not, uh, and not cast. Uh, and it also had a roof, uh, was very fast, independent suspension, 53 miles an hour, showed promise. We'll come back to it. Uh, in the meantime, it was also figured that a half-track mount would actually get to the front first. So uh, another expedient was the T-48, and that's the one at the bottom center. Uh, that took the 57 off of the T-44 and plonked it onto an M3 gun motor carriage. Well, at least that was the idea. Uh, it actually took a bit more tweaking than anticipated, but when it was done, it worked and it was considered superior to the M3 gun motor carriage. And the British and Soviets started buying them by the score. Not the Americans. And the reason was uh, they discovered that the 57 wasn't as good as they thought it was. And if I will quote from uh, one of the archive documents, it also appears from the information that the 57mm APC projectile, if and when developed, will still be inferior to the 75mm projectile at ranges in excess of 500 yards. It is believed that most tank destroyer action will be at ranges of over 500 yards. Decisions made by this headquarters regarding standardization of the 57mm for tank destroyers were based upon the assumption that APC ammunition was being developed. In view of the information now available, it is believed that there is nothing to be gained by continuing development of the 57mm gun as a tank destroyer weapon. Its only advantage over the 75 is in the time of flight of the projectile, and that advantage is more than offset by the lack of armor-piercing characteristics at ranges of over 500 yards, size of round, and complication of supply. The available 75mm guns may be used pending development of suitable mounts for the 3-inch gun and larger guns. So again, uh, that this w these weren't the only projects. The, the three inch we'll get to in a bit, but that was already on the way. Uh, and the issue with the smaller, lighter round is that it loses velocity faster. So although it may very well have had a higher mo uh, penetration capability up close, at long range, not so much. The 75 kept the uh, momentum. Now, that's not to say it was in any way a bad gun, and it became the standard U.S. Army anti-tank gun, uh, and was issued to the anti-tank companies of the infantry units, and saw plenty of service. Uh, ag again, note, the U.S. Army actually had anti-tank units, not just tank destroyer units. There, there is that huge distinction there. The anti-tank units, I mean, they, they were up with the infantry, and they were, you know, these give some chance up the front line, and also they were useful if uh, you know you're not facing the concentrated assault, but just local counterattacks or whatever. Absolutely, have your anti-tank gun along with you. So in the meantime, let's try the three-inch. Let's start at the bottom with the T1, and uh, this dates back to December of 1940. Cleetrack uh, suggested a 75 millimeter carrier on the basis of its tractor used by the Army Air Corps. Uh, Ordnance decided to put a 3-inch gun on it. Uh, the tractor could do 45 miles an hour, and the 3-inch was a good gun. With uh, It was going to have a good arc of fire. By the time they were through, all they ended up with was the great gun, this 
speed had dropped to 35 miles an hour maximum and dropped rapidly on curves. Uh, and it had neither the space nor protection for the crew and equipment, as well as structural issues with the weight being carried. I saw my first cleat track actually only about two weeks ago, and I was astounded as to how small this thing is. And I look at this going, where on earth did they think they were going to put a three inch gun on, on this? Uh, suffice to say, it took a year and a half in this program. Uh, it was officially accepted as the M5 before anybody really gave it approval. Uh, and pretty much as soon as they said, we'll call it the M5 and build it, they scrapped it. Now, the other two vehicles up there are the T24 top left, the T40 top right. These were attempts to make a tank destroyer out of the M3 medium. T24 was a stopgap uh, for the M5, but the T24 proved to be just about as impossible. Uh, the rework was so significant that they renamed it as the T40, and they uh, they put 50 of them uh, on order, until it was discovered that they only had 28 of the M1918 guns available. Uh, but this was going to be accepted as the M9. Uh, Tank Destroyer Branch did not want them for combat, thought they might be useful for training. Uh, but eventually it was just too much hassle, and they wouldn't be built any faster than the T35 anyway. So we go to the T-35. And, well, not much needs to be said about this one. You can get all sorts of information on the M-10 somewhere else. Uh, but basically, you start off with a thinner M-4 hull, no bow gun, and a round turret. That's your T-35. A lighter angled hull was the T-35E-1. And after the first couple of pilots, they put a hexagonal turret on there to give the, the crew more working space. Uh, this went off to Africa. It was gleefully received as a dramatic improvement over the M3 half-track. Tank Destroyer Center were a little bit less gleeful about it, however, because they still wanted their really rapid mobile thing, and this, well, frankly, it wasn't very much more mobile than a regular tank. So they go back to the search for mobility. Up at the top right, T27. And that was an attempt to make a smaller 75mm GMC than just the, ha uh, the half-track. And it's basically a Studebaker chassis with a 75 plonked on top. And it's just too light for the gun. Top left, T66. Now that took the T19E1 uh, armored car chassis, added a 75mm turret. And this turret was actually identical to that found on the T67 gun motor carriage when that came around the tracked one. In the end, the vehicle was found very capable, but was stopped for two reasons. Uh, firstly, it was deemed unlikely that the 75 would really meet long-term tank destroyer branch requirements. And the second problem was that the US was mucking around with far too many vehicles at the time, and some rationalization was required. Remember, all this R&D cost money, and time, and man hours, and things that the US didn't think it could really afford. So they set up what was called the Special Vehicle Board, which is also known as the Palmer Board, after the officer commanding. And this board was a death knell for a number of projects. Um, that you know, it, They may have been good projects, but something better was out there, or a more efficient use was out there. And the T-66 is one of these things that fell by the wayside. Bottom center is a T-55, and it was based off the Cook Interceptor, which is basically a wheeled APC. Uh, they shoved a 3-inch into it, and uh, it's actually it's a small vehicle. The, the, the stick to the right is a 6-foot-tall stick, so it's, it's not really a very much taller than I am. Uh, the T-55E1 was an s even smaller and meaner version. It looks more square and angular than this one does. Uh, but again, the program was cancelled for two reasons. Firstly, Tank Destroyer Board required cross-country mobility at least equal to that of a tank. And it was, ultimately. It was a wheeled vehicle, and wheeled vehicle suspension technology hadn't gotten to the level that it has today. And secondly, um, it ergonomically wasn't all that great anyway, so that went away. And of course there were also track designs going on. Uh, the T-67 was basically the earlier T-49 uh, with a 75. And it, it's worth pointing out that the designations for this vehicle changed not in sequence with the changes to the vehicle, because just changing the equipment doesn't change the designation. You actually have to go through ordinance committee meetings and they'll, they'll do it for you. So you will see reference, for example, to the 76 millimeter gun motor carriage T-49 in the archives, which effectively is the T-70, is the M-18 predecessor. 
Uh, around 1942, late 1942, they decided to move the vehicle to torsion bars 76 millimeter, and that will become the T-70. The M8 gun motor carriage was tank destroyer's unofficial designation for what was officially known as 78, 75mm gun M3 on M5 light tank chassis or so, something like that. Um, this was an attempt originally to upgun the light tank firepower in early 43, but TD Branch got a hold of it to see if it could be used as a field expedient tank destroyer until the M18 showed up. And they decided that, well, okay, yeah, there are some increases in mobility over the M10, but it's too cramped and sacrifices firepower, because again, you got the 75 versus the 3 inch. And most importantly, it didn't seem that by the time they made the required changes, it would get into service any faster than the T-70 would anyway, so that fell by the wayside. And similarly, the T-55 and T-56 were other attempts uh, to turn the M3 into a tank destroyer. And suffice to say, it was another victim of the Palmer board and was being cramped and small anyway. I mean, you look at the specifications and your first question is, where the devil do you put all the ammunition? Now, of course, things were happening in the real world. And uh, this photograph uh, from El Guitar, it's, a, it's a actually a fascinating photograph if you think about it. El Guitar was one of the few times that Tank Destroyer Battalion met a German armored thrust in the manner in which it was designed to meet them. Uh, so 57 German vehicles uh, went forward, and defending were 31 of the M3 half-tracks, 5 of the 37mm uh, Fargos, and 12 M10s showed up. And if you look carefully at this photograph, you'll see in the background is an, a uh, Panzer IV. In the middle are the wrecks of the half-tracks, and up front is what's left. Believe it or not, that's a Tiger. Now, by the time the battle was over, the Tiger didn't look like that. It was subsequently demolished uh, with, uh, with charges for some reason. I don't know what. Uh, but... Uh, these half-tracks with the 75s and a couple of 3-inch guns, they stopped this attack that was led by Tigers. And this is part of the reason that Tigers and Panthers didn't cause massive amounts of panic at home, is that we were meeting them and we were killing them. Uh, yes, there are easier ways to do it, but, but they died. Uh, the final result, the Germans lost 52 of the 57, the Americans lost almost all the half-tracks, 27 of them, and five of the M10s. Uh, again, lots of vehicles were lost, but they were cheap. Compare the cost of a half-track compared to the cost of these honest-to-god tanks like Panzer IVs and Tigers. The economy of force was in the tank destroyer's favor. It worked just as it was originally designed to. Now, one of the problems, though, was that uh, the tank destroyer guys were being a little bit overly aggressive and the aggression actually came from the manual. The, the way the manual was written, it could be misinterpreted for the troops to be a little bit more aggressive than perhaps they should have been, and a later version of the manual in, in 1944 de-emphasized the aggressive verbiage uh, so that uh, the tanks would no longer be charged by the tank destroyers as they were. However, more commonly, uh, the issue of tanks versus anti-tanks was settled by the towed guns. And as you are probably all very well aware, uh, the reports coming in from North Africa, particularly from the British, was that the towed anti-tank guns were causing havoc with the attacking armored forces. They'd, they'd be baited into the anti-tank gun, into the pack front, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this was proven to be music to McNair's ears. Uh, because he'd say, look, it is, it is now in, in evidence that the towed anti-tank gun is the master of the tank. So with this desert environment being learned, they decided they would convert half of the tank destroyers to towed tank destroyer battalions. Yay. So, <laughs> off they went. Uh, the 805th was uh, the only towed unit to go to Italy, and they were miserable. Uh, they achieved very little, they were perpetually mired, and eventually they ended up converting to the M18, uh, and they were famous for having the big white numbers on the back corners of the M18s. Uh, and this lesson was driven home in Normandy uh, as well. Uh, when you're attacking, 
toad guns just don't work well. Uh, especially if you're attacking over bad terrain, let alone attacking period. So by after Normandy, the lesson was driven home. We would like to reconvert back the vehicles, please. Lesson learned. But we're not done. No, no, not not down in uh, not down in Texas, Camp Hood. Uh, so by January '42, there were reports coming in of the Flak 18 on a half track. And the question was, well, if they can use this big anti-aircraft gun, and it's a self-propelled anti-tank gun, why the heck don't we do the same thing with ours? We got a 90 millimeter. Their 88 seems to have worked for them and seems to be effective. So the result, uh, they built on an M4, and it was the T-53. It was low, and the gun was powerful. I mean, you can see the relative uh, height of the vehicles here. Um, or was it? The crew configuration, lo look at the top left, it's absolutely ridiculous. You've got two crewmen, you know, one is underneath the vehicle getting the ammunition, one is so function is to get the ammo from bottom of the vehicle to top of the vehicle. By the time you put the gun shields in place, it's huge. Uh, and gun depression was also limited to only negative five, which wasn't really deemed great. Somebody in charge decided, well, okay, we can fix this and then build 500. And if we're building it, let's make it anti-aircraft capable as well. So that developed into the T-53E1. And this had a central mount for the gun. It had outriggers. This is the one at the bottom center of the uh, picture there. Tank destroyer branch were not amused. Uh, they had no interest in a dual-purpose weapon system. Uh, the vehicle still wasn't really any faster than a tank, and it wasn't any lighter or more mobile than a tank. And the increase in firepower didn't seem to be worth it because the three-inch gun was killing pretty much anything that it met in practice. And uh, when Ordnance Branch, uh, I've seen the minutes of this meeting, Ordnance Branch presented the... Uh, actually, I think I've copied it onto one of my articles. Uh, Ordnance Branch me uh, talks 90mm, I think is the name of the article. Uh, so they, they presented the vehicle to Bruce, and he was not happy. Um, he viewed this as another expedient that was being forced upon him, taking time, taking resources away from the T-70 that he wanted, that, that tank destroyer needed, tank destroyer branch. So finally, that's exactly what he got. The ideal tank destroyer. Small, fast, and hard-hitting. Fantastic. Well, these are some of the opinions uh, of the M18 once it, once it showed up. I think a couple of, well, you can read it, but just, you know, just uh, the M10 has been favorably commented upon because of its armor thickness. Um, one of one problem, which is probably not considered, but it, it was an issue, is that uh, the thing looked like. German vehicle because it had big independent road wheels, long gun with a muzzle brake. Uh, so there was actually some concern as there a, a lot of friendly fire. Uh, but other opinions, you know, an M10 will not save its crew from all shots, but will give them a better than even chance. Um, we would not willingly ask men to sacrifice themselves use uselessly, but that is what a T70 is compared to other weapon systems available. And one tank destroyer battalion, the A-35th, flat refused to convert from the M-10 to the M-18. We're going to come back to it, uh, I think, a little bit later on. So, in the meantime, a new role emerged. And uh, the... Uh, go back to my notes page. Lieutenant Colonel Barney was an artilleryman. He was in the 776 Tank Destroyer Battalion, and uh, he decided, well, why don't we see if we can fire these guns uh, in the indirect role? And indeed, most guns, most rounds fired by the Tank Destroyer Battalions, they were indirect. Uh, they had small rounds with long range, and they complemented the artillery units fairly well. Uh, if you if you recall from Operation Think Tank, Harry Eide was saying that they found that the three the three inch shell had almost the same blast effect as the 105, but did not crater the roads that they planned on using. Of course, there was a downside, and that that is increased barrel wear and uh, on the vehicles. But hey, if you're going to use it. Now, at this point, of course, the 76mm has now entered service, and Tank Destroyer Branch now has two types of round 
uh, that it needs to that it needs to supply the 76 and the 3 inch. So the thinking was, well, can we make uh, a lighter vehicle than the M10, or at least something with ammunition commonality? And the T72 is the one up at the top left corner. Uh, which you tweak, I think it was a T21 turret, uh, you thin it out, you stick the 76mm on that, and then you put it on top of the M10 chassis. Uh, but in the end, it was observed that well, the M18 was entering production to replace the expedient, the stopgap M10 anyway, so why bother? Uh, and besides, if you really have to use an M10 chassis, just stick the M18 turret onto the vehicle instead and you'll be grand. Uh, there, so bottom right corner is a picture of the M10 with the M18 turret, no gun. I don't believe that, that was ever fitted. But what if we need a bigger gun anyway? And this was a result of ordnance branch tinkering, uh, starting at late 42. Now, you, you remember what I said uh, about Barnes in the previous uh, videos, that he knew better than the ground troops what they needed. And sometimes he was flat wrong, but on occasion he had a point. So he starts playing around with the uh, 90 millimeter. Uh, tank destroyer branch were not impressed. The 3 inch 76 is perfectly fine, thank you very much. And the M10 chassis is too heavy and slow anyway, because hey, we've got the M18 now, this is what we want. Similarly, Army Grand Forces didn't want it, because uh, why are we funding another vehicle that is just going to be ordered and cancelled like half the other tank destroyers that we've, uh, we've approved? If nobody wants it, i.e. tank destroyer branch, we ain't gonna build it. Uh, but Barnes persisted. Uh, the upshot of it was, by September of 43, the viewpoint had changed, and there was more of a push to get the T-71, which became the M-36, built, even at the cost of M-10s. Uh, but there was still no great demand for the type from Europe, and the vehicle hadn't even been tested yet. Uh, eventually, Tank Destroyer Branch decided, okay, maybe this thing does have a purpose, but for the secondary role of concrete bunker busting. Now, it is to be remembered that by this point in the war, the, the reality on the ground had been realized that Tank Destroyers are actually being used for roles, not just what Tank Destroyer Doctrine said. It's got Basically, it's, as again, to quote Yidi, our, our local commanders weren't that stupid. They weren't going to leave things with personnel and guns and tracks sitting in the back just in case the opposition did something, which becomes a problem later on, but that, that was the thinking. Uh, so secondary roles became officially authorized for the, uh, for the tank destroyers to include as, uh, assaults and fortifications. And the 90mm was considered to be rather useful at this, uh, together with a reasonable armor. Uh, but there were still no requests for the 90mm from Europe until July of 1944, at which point it was, um, we'll take every 90mm gun we can get, please. Now you can make the, you can have a huge argument over the battle need uh, philosophy, uh, but the, the bottom line was that was there. Th as, as a bit of a sideline, uh, this is the T-86 T-86 or T-87, I can't remember which. Uh, this is basically an amphibious version of an M-18. Uh, and instead of just having the pontoons, uh, the, the swimming devices attached around it, this was designed from the ground up. The hull is a watertight hull with uh, shafts for, for propellers and so on and so forth. It was categorized as an amphibious motor carriage. Uh, as opposed to the GMC of the M18, but I just put it there for, uh, out, of, out of curiosity. It also had a stabilizer eventually fitted. So, what actually happened with the tank destroyers? Well, as I say, the locals, uh, the commanders, were not stupid enough to leave these things sitting around. They were unused weapons that could have a purpose. The problem was that after they had started distributing uh, the tank destroyers here, there, and everywhere, when the Germans did attack, they did no longer had the constituted tank destroyer battalion, tank destroyer company, to go deal with the problem. They, 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 had, they would then have to go to all the different subunits and say, hey, do you mind awfully, can we get our guns back, please? Um, so in the end result, the tank destroyer doctrine was almost never used. Uh, uh, again, because the, the environment was such that it wasn't very conducive for it. There, I think twice, once in once in Af Africa and once in Europe, did, did a tank destroyer unit per se actually get together. So after the war, what happened? 
the a series of surveys were requested and uh, th these are you know, uh, responses to the surveys of the opinion of do we want to have a separate armored force, do we want to have separate tank destroyer force and so on. And look at the signatures there, you've got Bradley, Hodges, Lightning Joe Collings, Matt Ridgway, Gillum um, was uh, a, of course the head of armored force then after um, after Devers uh, went to Europe. And if you look at the actual text of it, let me uh, bring this up a little bit in size. Uh, hopefully you can read it. Um, Bradley's opinion. Uh, no advantage of placing tank destroyer weapons in a separate branch. Uh, with powerful guns now being placed in tanks. The mission at present performed by self-propelled high velocity artillery. Y you know, it's relevant. Uh, Hodges. Tank destroyer should not be a separate branch. They should be a part of the arm employing them. So he had a slightly different idea. He, he, he just wanted to abandon the branch, but no problem with the equipment. Uh, he didn't approve of it for a coordinating function. Gillum. Um, Tank DD have been attacked with knowledge. I'm sure you can read it. Is, there, there is one very good one. I can't remember who actually wrote it. Uh, Collins is very simple. Uh, the best tank destroyer is another tank. Uh, Ridgeway had the same way. The tank can do everything the tank destroyer can do and more. If the, the infantry needs more AT weapons, just include them in the organic structure of the tank. Uh, include into its organic structure tanks. So uh, there's actually about 40 of these things in the archives, and, and and you can imagine what the general result was. Let's get rid of tank destroyers as a separate branch. So, did they work though? And this is uh, for the 823rd TD Battalion. Th uh, this is not a typical score sheet, I should add. Uh, in actuality, the score sheets tended to be... They were still, don't get me wrong, they were still in the favor of the tank destroyer units. And I actually had a couple of other typical ones written down somewhere. I seem to have lost that piece of paper and it's not on my notes here. Uh, but look at uh, the couple of things point uh, come, to no come to note immediately. Firstly, unit fired 4,000 rounds direct fire and 33,000 indirect. Now that actually is a pretty typical ratio. Vehicles destroyed, 111, including, they say, 18 Mark 6s. Um, I'm not sure where, but I guess I'll probably look it up. Uh, so they lost 53 people to kill 111, vehicle, 111 tanks, plus 13 armored cars, 13 SPGs, which basically means Sturmgeschutz, uh, and so on and so forth. To do all this, they lost 5 M10s. Uh, the 3-inch guns, the 18 of them that were lost, that was at Mortain. Uh, they were part of that group that was sent uh, to stem the German attack. Uh, and and I mean, look at it, that's, that's a pretty good ratio. Now again, that is one of the, that is not a typical, that, that is at the high end. But even at the low end, they were giving better than they got. So, in as much as a tank destroyer battalion was, or tank destroyers, were effective on a per vehicle basis, shall we say, that they worked fine. And the other thing to take away is that even today, we still have tank destroyers. We just don't call them tank destroyers. We are now call them mobile, mobile anti-tank systems, self-propelled anti-tank systems. And they could be surface vehicles, such as Centauro shown there. Uh, there are also tracked ones. This is brought the, the Chinese Type 89 just got removed from service and replaced by another wheeled gun TD. Uh, the missile systems, the LAV-AT, the M901 ITV, the, you know, those are all effectively tank destroyers. Lightly armed, armored systems with a gun or a weapon system capable and optimized for kicking out tanks. Even even the uh, the attack helicopter you see there, the A-864 battalions, that is as close to the tank destroyer concept for the Cold War as you were ever going to get. You were going to get a battalion of these things that were highly mobile, could swarm to the enemy armored assault, and destroy them. Outside for the fact that this is a rotary wing aircraft which doesn't have the sustainable, uh, the, s the persistence of a tank destroyer unit, i.e. To, to actually sit in one place, 
the concept though is absolutely identical. Go somewhere fast, meet the opposition, destroy them, and then go somewhere else really fast. Uh, and it was always a supplementary role. Uh, so that is uh, that's basically the end of it. Uh, so the last slide was uh, what are your questions? Obviously, in a webcast, that isn't going to be a something that we can do directly. However, I do respond to comments on YouTube, so feel free to throw in uh, a couple of questions in there, and I will get back to them as best I can. So thus ends the lesson, and uh, I guess we'll see if I can do another one. I guess the question is, what on earth do I know a lot about, or that I have resources to, to learn about, that hasn't already been covered. So I, I, while I think about that, uh, I figure I've got a couple of months before the next one. So I hope you found that somewhat informative. It wasn't a total waste of your hour and five minutes, and take care.